Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, National Family Caregiving Strategy, a State Roadmap for Supporting Family Caregivers. Before we get started, um, let's review a few technical items to make sure you can interact with us today. Q&A, um, please click on that Q&A button and a window will appear where you may submit a question. And we'll try to take as many questions as possible at the end of the webinar today. We are recording today's session. However, participant lines are muted. So there's no need to worry about the recording capturing your interaction. And we will provide access to the recording on Nashby's website for you to view and to share the recording as well as the slides after today's event. I wanna thank all of you for joining us today for this webinar. Next slide. Um, my name is Wendy fox Grage, and I am a Senior Policy Fellow here at the National Academy for State Health Policy. I want to thank both the John A. Hartford Foundation and the RRF Foundation for Aging for their generous support. As you can see from the, this agenda, we have a fantastic lineup of speakers. We have Scott Bain from the John A. Hartford Foundation, Greg Link, from the US Administration for Community Living, who's gonna be talking about the brand new released national strategy to support family caregivers. And then batting cleanup, we've got Cindy Mercer from Delaware's Department of Health and Human Services, who's going to be talking to us all about what's going on in Delaware. Um, next slide. Um, before we begin though, I wanted to point out a resource that we have for states that I think will be very valuable. Um, it is the RAISE Act State Policy Roadmap for Family Caregivers. These are actually six papers. Um, it's about two years worth of research that highlights the, the various different um, categories that are within the national strategy to support family caregivers and how states, what, how, what they can do to implement those strategies, what state strategies, and then promising practices, which states are doing that. And, and we wanted to share that with you all. So you can access these six papers at our, on our website at nashby.org, Roadmap for Family Caregivers. And on the next slide, you'll see the other uh, remaining three papers. So we encourage you to take a look at those um, which um, identify innovative and emerging policy strategies to support family caregivers. Next slide. And with that, I'm very happy to turn it over to um, my uh, our, pro our wonderful program officer, Scott Bain with the John A. Hartford Foundation. Scott, take it away. Thank you so much, Wendy. I, as, as Wendy said, I'm Scott Bain. I'm a program officer at the John A. Hartford Foundation. Next slide, please. A little bit about the foundation. We are a private philanthropy based in New York City. We were established in 1929 by the family owners of the A&P grocery store chain, for those of you that remember A&P. Next slide, please. Since 1982, we have focused on improving health care for older adults. And today we do that in three priority areas building age-friendly health systems, supporting family caregiving, and improving serious illness and end-of-life care. And as you can see from the graphic here, we very much see these three areas as interconnected and overlapping. Next slide, please. So in 2016, the foundation supported the National Academy for Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine's report, Families Caring for an Aging America. The report highlighted the need for, for person and family-centered care, the importance of family caregivers as an integral part of the nation's care for older adults, and the report makes four recommendations, one of which calls for a national family caregiving strategy, which was just so exciting that it was just re released the week before last. So we've actually hit one of those recommendations. Next slide, please. Since that time, the foundation has supported a lot of grant making connected with family caregiving, and I won't run through all of these, but just highlight a couple of them. At the top, engaging family caregivers through shared access to the electronic health record. At the bottom, support for family caregivers in an age-friendly health systems. And right next to it, support for diverse family caregivers. Next slide, please. 
So the RAISE Act Family Caregiver Resource and Dissemination Center, the RAISE Recognize, Assist, Include, Support, and Engage Family Caregivers Act of 2018 directs the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services to develop a national family caregiving strategy. The foundation funded a resource resource and dissemination center at the National Academy for State Health Policy as a policy program and research hub. Next slide, please. The goal of the resource and dissemination center is to support the work of the RAISE Act Advisory Council assembled by the Administration for Community Living. The resource and dissemination center has researched policies and evidence evidence-based programs, convened experts, and provided information to the public. They've tested the Advisory Council's recommendations for family caregivers giving policies and programs in Connecticut, Delaware, Illinois, Maryland, New York, and Utah. And now they are supporting the release of the national strategy to Congress, which again was just happened the week before last. So I will end by saying that the foundation is so pleased to be supporting this important work that everyone on the webinar is doing today. Thank you for all that you do on behalf of family caregivers. And now to talk more about the nuts and bolts of the national strategy, I pass the baton to Greg Link from the Administration for Community Living. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much, Scott. And thank you, uh, Wendy and our colleagues at NASHPE for inviting ACL to uh, talk with um, folks a little bit about what the National Strategy to Support Family Caregivers is and how we envision this as really a roadmap for states, communities, and others. Um, I have to extend a huge um, debt of gratitude and thanks to the John A. Hartford Foundation um, for their support of our work. Um, were it not for that generous support and of NASHP um, to serve as the Technical Assistance and Resource Dissemination Center, I really do not believe we would be where we are today um, talking about a living and breathing um, national family caregiving strategy. So if we can go to the next slide, please. So I just, I like to bottom line um, this discussion by, by saying that because family caregiving is or will be an issue that touches nearly every one of us in some way, we really must have a, a, an all hands on deck approach um, to addressing um, the needs and challenges of family caregiver family caregivers across the country. And this national strategy is really the first huge step in that endeavor. Next slide. So just to ground folks a little bit um, who may not be quite as familiar with the RAISE Act as uh, others, um, as Scott had alluded to, it became law in 2018 on January 22nd. And the RAISE Act has three key components. Uh, the establishment of a Family Caregiving Advisory Council, which was first convened in August of 2019. It consists of 15 non-federal members who, are, who represent a varying degree of backgrounds um, and professions, as well as family caregivers, people with disabilities and older adults themselves who need the support of a family member. It's also, the council is also comprised of members that represent various federal agencies across the government. And the um, all of the meetings of the council were, um, have been um, held publicly um, and virtual since the first convening in August 2019. And I really have to say that, um, as, as we all know, um, in early 2020, COVID, um, the COVID pandemic really changed how we operate and how we work. And the work of our council never stopped, even at the height of COVID. Uh, they kept um, they kept plowing on through um, the requirements of the act. The second key component is an initial report to Congress, and I'll have a, a link to that for those of you who haven't seen it. Um, that initial report to Congress highlights some of the key challenges that family caregivers face. It examines the impact of family caregiving on Medicare and Medicaid programs, and it makes a series of key recommendations um, that have formed the basis of the national strategy that we're talking about today. And then the third component is that national strategy to support family caregivers. Um, and it's going to be updated biannually. We see this as a real living 
breathing document. Um, the work that we do that ACL does um, is, is funded at about $400,000 per year with federal funds. And so for those of you who understand um, how far uh, funding can go, um, particularly you know, in an environment like this, um, you know it's a very small amount. And so that is why, again, we are so grateful um, to the support of the Johnny Hartford Foundation for really helping us to make this a well-rounded and holistic effort. Next slide. So I first want to talk about how the Family Caregiving Advisory Council grounded their work in defining family caregivers. Um, there are a number of definitions in federal statute um, for how caregivers are defined. The, the Advisory Council really, really focused some time and energy to ensure that their definition of family caregivers was as broad and inclusive as it could possibly be. And so that meant including people of all ages, um, from youth and young people to grandparents, people with disabilities, and those even providing care from a distance, and people who meet a wide variety of needs um, of those they support, from um, supporting people with intellectual and developmental disabilities, people with serious illness um, like cancer, um, and other debilitating illnesses, and also assisting with daily tasks that can be challenging. Um, and the, the term family caregiver in this case also recognizes that a single individual may receive support from multiple family caregivers. Next slide, please. So here is a link to the initial report to Congress. Um, the title on, at the top of the slide is a hyperlink. Um, that report was delivered to Congress in September of 2021, um, and it includes the report is really unique uh, for federal reports in that it literally speaks to you um, through NASHP's grant from the John A. Hartford Foundation, um, they partnered with the National Alliance for Caregiving and during the height of COVID, um, interviewed 26 family caregivers from across the country and talked to them about their experiences. Those video recordings are then linked throughout the report so to bring um, to bring real meaning and, and um, clarity to each of the 26 recommendations that are included in the report. And so the report literally does speak to you. And I think it's something that's quite unique. Next slide, please. So the report um, contains um, 26 recommendations that are grounded in five priority areas for action. Um, one, the first goal or priority area is around increasing and improving awareness and outreach. The second is around the critical component of engaging family caregivers as partners in health and long-term services and supports. Then the third goal area is um, strengthening services and supports for family caregivers, financial and workplace security, and then finally, research, data, and evidence-informed practices. What I want to point out here is that at the point that the strategy began to come together and be developed, um, ACL decided to combine the work of the Family Caregiving Advisory Council with that of a similar group, the Advisory Council to Support Grandparents Raising Grandchildren, so that they could together as two groups work to address the full, um, the full array of family caregiving situations and population groups. And so you'll see the strategy that was developed speaks to the grandparent, older relative and kinship caregiving populations as well with some very unique, um, unique action steps that can be taken. And, and fortunately, the Grandparent Advisory Council's report included um, recommendations that were grounded in five very, very similar priority areas, and it really lent itself very well to the development of a single cohesive national strategy. Next slide, please. One of the key areas that NASHP, through their grant, has been so incredibly supportive to the work of the councils was in their um, in how they facilitated the extensive public engagement that went into the development of both the initial report to Congress as well as um, the National uh, Family Caregiving Strategy. Um, in 2019, shortly after the RAISE Council's first um, and the Grandparent Council's first public meetings, um, ACL issued two requests for information 
to the public that really sought to ex um, hear from them on some of their key challenges um, that they were facing as family caregivers or as providers and advocates. Um, th those RFIs also asked um, respondents to provide recommendations for how for needed changes to both programs, policy, legislation, and you name it. Um, NASHP was able to support the ACL in the analysis of that information, um, as well as convening of focus groups um, in 2020 that really dug in deeper to the information that was gathered um, as a result of these um, RFIs. And then later in 2020, all the way through um, 2021, NASHP was again working with their partners at the at UMass Boston and Community Catalyst to convene stakeholder listening sessions um, with key stakeholder organizations from across an array of entities. You see them listed here. Um, and those, those listening sessions and key informant interviews laid the groundwork for how the advisory council began to operationalize and think about how each of the recommendations that were included in their initial reports could be operationalized by any number of sectors, including states, communities, health and long-term services sectors, um, healthcare systems, um, faith-based providers and faith-based organizations, school systems, child welfare systems, you name it. Next slide, please. So here is a, is a slide that contains links to all four components of the national strategy. Um, it is a comprehensive document. Um, it is not a quick read, um, but we believe that it is. Um, it provides the tools and the roadmaps and the information um, that any number of those sectors that I just named and more um, can use as they begin to think about how to better support family caregivers. The first um, link is to the main narrative of the strategy. Uh, it provides an overview and description of the strategy's goals and intended outcomes. Um, all all of the actions are linked to outcomes that various sectors can, can identify that they would like to achieve. We also recognize, and the councils also recognize, that family caregiving is a very multi-layered um, and very nuanced experience, and it requires a nuanced approach um, to uh, developing the appropriate services and supports uh, for recognizing um, and supporting family caregivers. And so the first principles document um, discusses some of the key cross-cutting considerations for family caregivers and family caregiver support. And it talks about four key principles in the areas of participant and family-directed care, trauma-informed services, um, it, the implications for the direct care workforce, and um, and I'm blanking on another one, but um, perhaps Wendy can pop in here because it has gone right out of my head. But one of the key um, the key areas uh, for cross cutting considerations is the what the implications of the direct care workforce um, are. Um, we know that that there is a tremendous workforce crisis um, in our country today, and so this. This cross-cutting principles document talks about some things that the various sectors, including states, can do to really think about how they can mitigate some of the direct care workforce issues in their states. We know that while the strategy talks to family about family caregivers, that in order to effectively support family caregivers, we need to have a workforce that can do so because without one, without an adequate workforce, family caregivers won't be able to continue in their roles, but also without adequately supported family caregivers, the, the paid workforce and the direct care workforce would be completely inadequate. And we also know that states have a big role to play and are playing in addressing some of the workforce issues in our country today. Um, the third document, to the strategy is a list of federal actions. Um, nearly 350 actions from 15 different federal agencies uh, that they will take in the near term over the next, the course of the next two to three years to better support family caregivers. And then we have our fourth document, which is the actions for states, communities, and others. More than 150 different actions um, that, that these various sectors can take. And there's a lot in here for states. And this is where, again, where NASHP's work to develop roadmaps for states um, has, become, has come in so useful um, and will be a very useful tool for states uh, as they begin to look at the strategy and decide where they want to have the greatest impact. Next slide, please. 
So as I've kind of alluded to, the strategy has many intended audiences and intended users. Um, it's not a, it's not strictly federal actions that will be needed and federal actions that will be taken, but it is also a real menu of possible actions that states, tribes, and communities, and all all of these other um, audiences and intended users um, can tap into. Um, we see this as many sectors coming together for an all hands on deck approach to addressing the needs of family caregivers. And so really, I think the list of, of intended audiences and users here is just to start. Um, it's fairly comprehensive, but there's always the opportunity to um, to bring more more participants and more stakeholders into the tent um, so that we can take the most comprehensive and broad approach to supporting family caregivers. And that's why, as I've said earlier, this is a living document. The strategy is going to be updated over the uh, it continuously over the course of, of year after year, um, the, the Family Caregiving Advisory Council will be considering updates to the strategy, looking for new policy challenges and, and support challenges that face family caregivers. And so the, this national strategy that was released a, a little over a week and a half ago um, is just that, it's the first and it's by no means the last. Next slide, please. So if, I know that a, a very large part of this of the folks watching this webinar today are are from states, um, and but there may be some community based organizations and others, but there are really actions in here for everybody. Um, there's extensive discussion about how ways and ideas for increasing awareness and recognition of family caregivers, um, and also in caregiver inclusion in healthcare teams. Um, that was a big discussion among the council members is how do we ensure that family caregivers where appropriate and where desired are, are key and integral component of the healthcare team, uh, whether it's in the hospital or a long-term care facility setting or in a transitional situation where someone needing supports is transitioning from one setting to another. Family caregivers should be at the table and involved in those discussions. There's also discussion of the need for increasing the use of um, caregiver assessments, training of professionals in better recognizing and understanding the needs of family caregivers. Um, there are many, many um, actions in there for just expanding services under goal three. I think 10 different areas for action just to um, expand the services and supports for family caregivers. Um, we also talk extensively about strengthening the direct care workforce and also help taking actions to mitigate um, some of the financial um, and career impacts of, of family caregiving. And then there's also um, extensive discussion and ideas for researchers in the field. We know that research in family caregiving has um, gained steam in recent years, but there's always more work to do um, to better understand those people that we're serving. And the, um, the ideas for future research topics, I think, begin to really uh, lay the groundwork for researchers in this area um, and provide them with a roadmap um, for better shaping our understanding of the needs of family caregivers. Next slide. So I'm not going to read through these, but I just pulled out a few examples of some of the actions that are in the, the um, actions for states, communities, and other sectors document. Um, we speak to tribal um, entities as well, to municipal governments and to state agencies, um, but how they can do things as simple as, as issuing guidance to their provider networks on defining family caregivers and family in the widest possible terms so that nobody is, is left out of the family caregiving discussion. Um, in, ensuring that your state and government and, and tribal websites include update, updated and accurate, accurate and culturally and linguistically appropriate representations of family caregiving so that family caregivers who come looking for information see themselves reflected in the information that's presented to them and can truly identify and self-identify as family caregivers. Next slide, please. And then we listed just a few more ideas for states, um, how states can perhaps increase the, the use of family caregiver assessments by looking you know, at existing assessment tools and make 
to make sure that they are trauma informed and culturally competent. Um, many states have enacted CARE Act legislation and how can, um, maybe there are some steps that, that states can take to strengthen the, um, the implementation of the CARE Act requirements. Um, and also developing educational campaigns about the value of, of integrating caregivers into healthcare, social services, educational and child welfare systems. All of these places are uh, places that family caregivers oftentimes tend to feel excluded or are excluded, um, but having them at the table and present in those discussions can add tremendous value um, to the discussion and to the and to the services and supports for the individual um, that they're that they're caring for. Next slide. So while there's a lot in the strategy and while there's a lot to it, um, there's also things that the strategy is not. Um, and the council, the advisory councils that pulled this first strategy together were very clear on that. They wanted to see, they wanted this strategy to be a vision and a roadmap for meaningful change, but not a timeline and, and not a how-to document. So you, readers won't find um, tips or ideas for how to implement things. Um, that's that's going to take time and creativity by all of the sectors addressed. And this is where, again, NASHPE um, will, has been working so hard to develop tools and resources that can really answer that how-to question for states and other sectors. It provides a baseline for action and progress, but it does not contain requirements or musts. Um, it offers um, strategies for many stakeholder groups, but we certainly recognize that it is not exhaustive and it's by no means final. And then finally, as I've said before, this is the first national strategy and it's not the last. Um, the We've just gone out, ACL just opened a period of public comment um, today that will last through the end of November. And this is our first step in actually obtaining information that is gonna give the next Family Caregiving Advisory Council the tools and information they need to revise and update um, this first national strategy. And this will be an ongoing process of public engagement, information gathering and updating to the strategy. Next slide. So we've talked a lot about this and Wendy provided a good overview. Here is just a link to um, the Resource and Dissemination Center that has been established and that is continuing to grow and evolve as, um, as our work continues. Um, encourage folks to really check out the tools and resources and information that are there. Next slide, please. So looking ahead, um, we are currently in the process of um, extensive stakeholder and media engagement around the national strategy. The public comment period opened today, and it will um, be open, like I said, until the end of November. Um, ACL is beginning to work with um, NASHP and their partners on their grant on their grant from the John A. Hartford Foundation to analyze the federal actions that are there to identify opportunities for collaboration and coordination across federal agencies. And then once the public comment period closes, um, we're going to be looking very carefully at analyzing the input that we received from the public um, and use that to inform the work of, of the next council and future updates to the reports to Congress, as well as the national strategy. And then of course, as hopefully everyone knows, November is National Family Caregivers Month. Um, we are anticipating a presidential proclamation towards the very end of October, the very first of November. Um, social media and stakeholder engagement throughout the month around the strategy, and ideally, and hopefully the seating of, of two new councils, um, one for the RAISE Act and the other for the Supporting Grandparents Raising Grandchildren Act. We are actively looking now at the nominees and hope to have selections made and new councils convened before the month of November is out. Next slide, please. So that concludes my overview of the strategy and I'm gonna turn it next to Cindy Mercer to talk about what is going on specifically in Delaware. So Cindy, I'll turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. So um, my name is Cindy Mercer from the state of Delaware. I'm with the Department of Health and Social Services, Division of Services for Aging and Adults with Physical Disabilities, which is also the state unit on aging in a state without triple A's. We are a single planning and service area. Um, DeSapid was awarded a state Medicaid Policy Institute on Family Caregiving grant, and I was part of the Delaware team along with several colleagues from the state's Medicaid office, AARP, representatives of our provider network, and caregivers. 
around nine years ago when I started my work with DSAPID was the same time I became a caregiver. So I've be, remained interested in how our state can and should do more to support unpaid and family caregivers. Next slide. Um, uh, Delaware has historically supported our caregivers by providing respite services and also by operating a network of caregiver resource centers that provide information, support, and outreach to caregivers. Delaware's 2020 to 2024 state plan on aging acknowledged the need to support caregivers in a more cohesive way throughout the state. The strategies identified in the state plan, the current efforts of cross-sector partners, such as the Legislative Caregiver T Task Force and the work of the NASHP grant will propel implementation of key policy and programmatic priorities, expansion of supports, and a coordinated outreach campaign. DSAPID applied for the NASHP grant because we wanted to do more as a state to create meaningful support, sustainable long-term supports for caregivers. DeSapid's grant goals included expansion of services, targeting of underreached and underserved populations, and engagement of public and private partners for involvement in a sustainable action network, and reevaluation of the use of DeSapid's Title III E funding. Next slide. Um, the Delaware team convened for the grant work, decided that conducting uh, the focus groups of diverse caregivers was the best way to assess caregiver needs in Delaware. Wilder Research um, was selected at, to, um, to conduct the focus groups. And um, it was important to the Delaware team that the focus groups target several populations that are underserved in Delaware, including LGBTQ male caregivers, Asian Pacific Islanders, rural communities of color, and caregivers of those diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease or related dementias. Respite vouchers were provided so that the caregivers were able to, um, to arrange for care of their loved ones so they could participate in the focus groups. Recruitment for focus groups was done by the Delaware team members and consisted of emails, newsletters, social media posts, and Delaware legislators' newsletters and media social media posts. Caregivers were compensated with a gift card of their choice, Amazon, Walmart, or Wawa at the completion of focus, the focus group that they participated in as a way of thanking them for taking the time out of their busy lives to participate. You all don't know what Wawa is, do you? <laughs> oh, it's a it's a local convenience store, um, Delaware, Pennsylvania area. Uh, the fit, fit, Wilder Research completed eight focus groups within. Uh, I'm sorry. Next slide. With 38 participants, participants were asked to share basic information about their background characteristics, including demographics, their work and income status, and details about their caregiving. On this slide, you can see the demographics of the caregivers who participated in the focus groups. Caregivers were asked to share information about how long they've been providing care, the amount of time they provide each week, whether they live with their care recipient, supports they provide, and other services they may use to help support them with caregiving. Next slide. In this slide, you can see that 37% were providing care to a parent, in-law, or, or partner's parent. 13% were caring for a spouse or other partner. These caregivers provided a significant amount of care with very few providing less than 10 hours each week for their loved ones. Next slide. 89% of the caregivers were living with their care recipient, 53% of them were employed, and 58% of the care recipients qualified for Medicaid. 84% um, of the caregivers assisted with IADLs like shopping, preparing meals, housekeeping, using transportation, taking medications, and managing personal finances. Um, 65% of the caregivers provided assistance with ADLs and unpaid and family caregivers, as you can see, unpaid and family caregivers, we all know this, are holding up the system of care in Delaware, providing supports that the state could never provide in their absence. Next slide. 
The main findings from the focus groups was that um, first, caregivers are completely stressed out, which we all already know. Um, second, that caregivers don't know where to get help. A lot of them said uh, that they had no idea that any kind of support was available. Um, and, the, and surprising to us that they're going broke paying for or providing caregiving for their loved ones. We can see on the slide some of the um, co comments that we received. Next slide. During the course of the grant and through its work, several decisions were made about how Delaware could do better to support family caregivers. First, a caregiver campaign is being developed close to being launched that promotes self-identification as a caregiver. So many people think they're just doing what they're supposed to do when their loved one needs help, but this can prevent them from seeking supports if they don't recognize themselves as a caregiver. The campaign will also identify the availability of resources and supports. DeSapid has dedicated a state position for an administrator for caregiver and dementia policy. This began when our um, local Alzheimer's Association chapter reached out to us to ask us to create a dementia coordinator position like many other states are doing. Because of Delaware's size, we decided to dedicate a position to both caregiving and dementia policy work. We've decided to enhance training for our no wrong door system, including our case managers and aging and disability resource center. And DSAPID and DMMA, the state's Medicaid office, have participated in a legislative aging in place work group that's part of a larger task force. Uh, and the initiatives that are be being brought forward to legislators in Delaware. This may result in future bills being introduced that will support unpaid and family caregivers. DeSapid has also been working with advancing states on modernizing its service delivery process and improving its efforts to connect people in need of services with the most appropriate funding source for service. Next slide. DeSapid is currently recruiting for the Delaware Action Network for Caregivers, which will be comprised of caregivers and will be supported by state and primarily of caregivers and will be supported by state and community agencies. The dementia and caregiving coordinator will facilitate these meetings and the state and community agencies will provide education and guidance to the action network on how funding is allowed to be utilized and what supports could be implemented within various funding sources. When finalized, the Delaware Action Network for Caregivers will explore findings in the focus group findings from the focus group report. DeSapid received a technical assistance grant from the National Center on Advancement of Person-Centered Practices, just NCAPS, and has focused most of its work on diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. Delaware is using the findings from the focus groups to develop a plan of action for improving supports for caregivers and DeSapid is considering changes to how it uses Older Americans Act funds in an effort to better support caregivers. Next slide. Uh, when the national strategy to support family caregivers was released this month, um, and as last month, and as a result of the NASHP grant, Delaware has a few things in the works that align with several of the suggestions made in the report. Um, two bills introduced in the legislators support family caregivers, one that passed and the other is pending um, address caregiver support needs. The Healthy Delaware Families Act, this bill allows workers to take time off from their paid jobs to recuperate from, to recuperate from their own illness or to care for a loved one or a new baby without the fear of losing their paycheck. Senate Bill 1 soon will be a law also known as the Health, Healthy Delaware Families Act, allows workers to take time off to care for their loved ones and, um, and, and um, employers will benefit from the better productivity and less stress among employees. Senate Bill 143, this bill creates a, a non-refundable individual income tax credit for qualified expenses incurred by a family caregiver. Um, to be qualified, the well, uh, 
to, I'll save you the qualifications, but you have to meet certain qualifications. And subject to a number of limitations, a claimant may claim 50% of the costs of qualified expenses um, paid each year for family caregiving. Next slide. So those are just the beginning. That's just the beginning. And DeSapid will be utilizing the National Strategy Report to inform best practices going forward and, um, and, uh, and utilize the, the, um, the strategy, but also the work of the NCAPS grant. So that's it for me, passing it back to Wendy. Great, thank you so much. Wow, Over. that was fantastic. Okay, time for Q&A and we've received quite a few um, questions. I'm gonna take the first um, several. So um, we uh, heard loud and clear from you all that you were not able to access any of the links that were in the, um, in the PowerPoint presentation. Um, so good news, we are going to be publishing the slides on the Nashby website very soon, along with the recording. So um, those are coming soon. But if you want to read the national strategy right now, you can by going to acl.gov slash caregiver strategy. And all those documents that Greg referred to are there. Also, we encourage everyone on this webinar to um, please help the next um, councils by giving your input and your feedback about that national strategy, because it is open for public comment. You can reach the pu public comment section at acl.gov slash backslash caregiver strategy backslash comments. So we encourage you to do that. And again, we will be posting everything to our website um, as, soon as, as soon as possible. Okay, now to the questions. Um, so um, we, um, we, and yes, thank you. Uh, yes, it, it, the, uh, many of those links were also sent by Kim, my colleague um, in the chat. So encourage you to, follow along there as well. Okay, so we um, we received a, a question that I think both Greg and Cindy can answer. Um, so Kit asks us um, about, you know, if, if you all could speak about identifying and supporting quote unquote silent caregivers who culturally do not feel comfortable reaching out. Um, we know that cultural competency was mentioned on your slides. And so wanted a little more information about that, as well as are you seeing an increase to access given now with, with telehealth and that type of support? So sure, I can, I can um, start to answer that question. And thank you for that question. You reminded me of the fourth cross-cutting consideration that um, went completely out of my head when I was speaking. And that is um, around cultural um, um, cultural competence and re and respect for diversity and inclusion, um, we know that that in addition to the complexities of any family caregiving situation, um, we also understand the complexities that can be layered on when you have cultural um, and ethnic um, differences as well, because we know that different cultures view the role of family caregiving in very, very different ways. And that can shape how, an, how individuals um, identify, if they identify even, and also the extent to which they may accept and benefit from services and supports. And so the, the, we, we talk at some length about how services and supports and the better recognition and inclusion of family caregivers has to be done with an eye towards speaking to their cultural um, differences, their cultural preferences, um, and done so in a linguistically competent manner. Um, I think that you know one of the one of the silver linings, if we can call it that, of the COVID pandemic has been the increase um, in the use of telehealth um, and and as a means of of accessing and being um, in, increasing access to services and supports. Um, and I think this has been a, made a huge difference and can and holds 
huge promise for um, very for populations, diverse populations, those in more rural and isolated areas, um, and those with limited income and the means to travel to services and supports, being able to receive counseling and participate in support groups um, and receive education and training via telehealth um, or similar means. I think opens the door for family caregiver supports in areas that we haven't seen before. Um, we're just starting, I, I think, to work on this, and I think we have a lot more to do. Um, but the the strategy does provide, I think, some some very useful, practical ideas for um, being able to reach um, caregivers from all all backgrounds and all diverse all diverse situations to better serve and support them. So, Cindy, if you have something you'd like to add. I, I would just add that um, because of the other grant that I mentioned, um, we've really focused a lot of our um, attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and recognizing that we're not reaching certain populations that, that we want to. So, um, and that's another reason why we are looking at, um, at maybe changing um, how we use our Title III E funds, because as I mentioned, we are, it's almost designed as like a drop-in center or a call-in center. And we know that people don't, don't reach out for help in that way. As Greg said, the, you know, telehealth support access has been, um, has been a positive, but um, we, we, we recognize the need to get out into the communities instead of um, expecting them to come to us. And that's the main takeaway for us from all of this. Great, thanks. Okay, we've received three different questions, and I'm going to lump them all together. That I'll, and Greg, this one is for you. That you know, there's been a lot of examples and talk about, in particular, caregivers um, of older adults. But does the national strategy look at other populations? For example, um, parents of children, um, IDD. Um, pediatric, medically complex, and fragile populations? Yes, it does. The, the national strategy, um, as I had, in one of my very early slides, I showed or included the, the broad definition of family caregiving that the council used to center their work. Um, that definition was really meant for them to be their, their touch point for every action that they included in the strategy. And that was to take the broadest possible definition of family caregiver that we can. For that reason, the strategy itself doesn't mention specific populations or interventions for specific populations of caregivers dealing with, with specific situations. Really, we, we look at this as a tool for those groups to look at what's out there, what's contained in the strategy, and say, how can this be applied to, for example, um, you know, caregiver parents, caregivers slash parents of medically fragile children or of adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. As I'd said, this this is we don't we don't talk about dementia specifically in this strategy. It's really meant to as broadly as possible discuss what can be in terms of family caregiver supports for any population. I hope that answers the question. Great, thanks. Okay, for this next question, it deals with workforce challenges. Um, so uh, Megan says, you know, there are many parallels to gaps and challenges within childcare, workforce shortages, cost of care for families, et cetera. Can you speak to strategies or successes to engage partners across the entire lifespan and care spectrum to address many of these challenges? Um, but that's a that's a great question, and yes, um, there are a, a huge number of parallels um, in in terms of the workforce challenges that we're facing, um, both on the child care side um, as well as in the you know the care of older adults and people with disabilities. Um, I think we're just beginning to go down that road. I know that you know um, ACL has just launched, or it will be announcing the the launch of a new technical assistance resource center 
around the direct care workforce um, that will be looking to really support states and other sectors in how they address the, the workforce issues and the workforce inadequacies. Um, and I think they're going to be taking a very broad look at how at what workforce means. Um, I wish I had a more specific answer than that, but I, at this point, I just don't. Okay, thank you. Um, so we have some um, of our attendees who um, you, who who would like to contact um, uh, someone in their region, in their in their community, to uh, re to learn more about services and supports for family caregivers. Um, Greg, is there like a is there some way we can um, direct them to where they can go to get this kind of information? Um, so are we talking about the, the question, um, they, they're having, um, having another bureaucracy to navigate? Um, is that the question? Uh, no, there's one that was even earlier where they, um, th they're needing, um, some help at the, at the local level. And I'm wondering is probably the elder locator. So there, for, fam for family caregivers, there are a number of resources available nationally that can help find the services and supports that are available to you. The first one would be the Elder Care Locator, um, which is funded by ACL and administered and operated by U.S. Aging. Um, that can connect you to local services and supports, not only for older adults, but also for family caregivers. There's also the No Wrong Door system. Um, which um, was previously called Aging and Disability Resource Centers. Those ADRCs or No Wrong Door Systems are also accessible um, through the Elder Care Locator. There's um, the Alzheimer's Association, um, also funded by ACL, operates um, a, a, an Alzheimer's call center that provides enhanced um, call-in options and supports and referral for um, families dealing with dementia. Um, and then the ARCH National Respite Network and Resource Center operates the National Respite Care Locator. Um, and on there, you can search by state and community for respite care providers in your area. Um, so there are a number of, of, of avenues to, to go. We always, uh, in the the INR information referral services that ACL funds. Our goal is to always get the caller to the local support that can be of most assistance to them as quickly as possible. Great, thanks so much. And then um, Cindy, I'm gonna uh, direct this question toward you because it deals with state funding for implementation. Um, and um, since you're in the throes of it, um, do you anticipate there being funding or recommendations of funding to support states' capacities to implement some of the recommendations we've been talking about today? At, at this point, no. <laughs> we um we would we would have to be planning for that well ahead of time so um that is not in the works at the moment so you're just using existing funding sources mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. to implement okay yes. very good um okay let's see if i think we've got time for maybe one one more or so um let's see um, 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 um. Um, oh, this deals with some of the healthcare related recommendations and some of the maybe the biggest stakeholders um, from healthcare organizations and um, kind of the role of healthcare and health organizations in, in recommendations and implementation. Well, um, and, and what is the question? Um, yeah, uh, who are some of the biggest stakeholders from healthcare organizations? How much of a role did they play in the healthcare related recommendations? I know that we had a number of listening sessions and we wanted to really make sure we did this through um, UMass Boston um, and uh, with Community Catalyst. And I know that we reached out as part, as part of those listening sessions, we reached out to a, num a large number of different groups to make sure that they did weigh in because as Greg was talking about earlier, um, one, of the, one of the big parts of the national strategy is engaging family caregivers within the healthcare, within healthcare systems. Um, and since they really are part of the care team, really being acknowledged as part of that care. 
Correct. And so while the invitations for the stakeholder listening se sessions um, went out far and wide, um, in the back of in the main narrative of the strategy, you can see the organizations that actually participated. And, you know, we probably didn't capture all of them. However, the public comment period that's out and open now would be an opportunity for any of these um, organizations and other stakeholder networks to provide comment um, and talk about where um, their sector can become even more involved or steps that they can take. This is exactly the kind of information that we will need to um, to continue to grow and, and adapt the strategy to the changing policy environment. And as we get new information about, you know, for example, what healthcare organizations can do, this can go, that type of information can go into future updates to the national strategy. Great, thanks. Scott, I've got one for you. Um, what is the role of philanthropy with the um, implementation of the national strategy? Sure. The, there are lots of things that foundations can do, and in the best of all possible worlds, private money from philanthropy complements public sources. So, you know, maybe a funder would fund a, an evaluation of a promising program or fund a public education campaign to engage people in a particular location about self-identifying as a family caregiving and uh, going from there. So there are lots of different things that private funders can do. And it's something very much at the John A. Hartford Foundation that we see it as uh, our mission to engage our colleagues in this work over the long term of actually implementing the national strategy. Great, thank you. Okay, and I think we have time for this last question. Um, we've actually received a couple of questions about paying family caregivers. So through consumer directed um, care models. So um, question, could changes to existing regulations for caregiver support services be streamlined to ensure that states are able to include consumer directed care models? There's also a question about paying um, family caregivers of parents of children with special health needs. Yeah, so that's a, those are um, great related questions. Um, and yes, we, we know um, from the research that the financial considerations that family caregivers have and the need for financial compensation or reimbursement are one of the most requested types of supports of family caregivers. We also know that to meaningful change and, you know, change to, um, you know, employment laws and employment regulations um, are going to take acts, you know, legislative changes and changes in regulation and policy. And that's one of the reasons why um, the, the Family Caregiving Advisory Council um, in the development of the strategy was very, very um, adamant that there be a list and a, a slate of actions that could be taken by Congress, state legislatures, and other policymakers to change or adapt existing laws and regulations to allow for um, and to recognize um, the financial impacts of family caregiving. Um, so it's most likely not going to be things that um, can be done through the establishment of a new program, but rather, or a service system, but rather through the ch through changes to um, legislation or regulation or some other type of policy. That's why one of the major groups um, that that the, the council saw as um, a target audience for the strategy is advocates, because we believe that there's a, a real roadmap for advocacy throughout the strategy for changes that need to be made for new programming, for new legislation, um, or revising legislation um, to meet the, the needs um, of family caregivers. I think that's a great note to end on. And I want to thank everybody for attending our meeting today, our webinar, and thanks so much to our speakers. Um, we're going to end just a minute early because as Kim put in the chat, we want to remind you all to please complete the survey at the end of this webinar. You should be getting that very, very shortly. And, um, and it's also in the chat as well. And we cannot thank you all enough and we hope you have a wonderful day.
Thanks again, all. Take care. Thank you, everyone.